So um, I'm, this morning, this is not really a sermon, okay? So um, for those of you who are used to a sermon, you know, like with a particular teaching topic um, and lots of scripture, which I love, like I really love that. It's part of my, you know, um, what, how I share. But this morning, I just, as I was just spending time preparing and thinking and praying and you know, just asking the Holy Spirit, you know, what what can I share this morning that's useful, that might be useful and practical to people's lives? Because there's so many messages out there. You just Google and YouTube and there's so many amazing things that are being shared. But I thought, I just wanted to share some things that I've been discovering on my journey. And I guess um, this early last year, um, I was invited by a social media friend that I've known for a few years um, by the name of Dub Um, and he lives in America and he invited me to speak to his uh, online kingdom school. I think he's got, I don't know, hundreds of students from across the place and he asked me to share um, via Zoom uh, to all of these students and he asked me to share um, from some of my um, experience uh, in pastoring you know, for over 25 years or something like that. And he wanted me to call it like one thing I knew, one thing that I wish every kingdom saint knew um, and how it could impact their everyday lives in advancing the kingdom. Like that's what he asked me to speak about. Um, But I want to start out by saying that (laughs) I've revamped this a little bit. Um, And, you know, even... You know, since the, those two years ago, I feel like I've sort of moved on a little bit as well. So um, this is probably, well, it is part of a two-part talk. So I'm only giving you part one today. And like I said, it's not, a, it's not exactly what you would call a typical sermon. It doesn't have one or two things in particular, but a collection of some of my thoughts. Um, and if I were to change the message this morning, it would just be, you know, like things that I wish every follower of Jesus would know. Okay? So um, the first thing I wanted to say, like declarations. Now, like we've made some declarations today, and they were been powerful and amazing. And declarations, they're great. And we make them a lot here in this church. Um, And these declarations are those things that we amen, okay? Those things that we agree with, like Jesus is Lord, that God is good, that the cross was successful, resurrection makes all things new. These are declarations, they're absolutes, they're the things that we declare and we give a resounding amen to, right? Would you say that? Good. But a good, you know, like a good sermon... Um, and our friend Shane Willard sort of first introduced this idea a few years ago. But a good sermon, not that this is a sermon, but a good sermon is not just about making declarations that we all agree with. A good sermon is meant to be wrestled with. Okay? I'll just say that again. A good sermon is not necessarily about all those things that we agree with. A good sermon will challenge us. You think about the sermons of Jesus. They were challenging. good sermon will challenge us. A good sermon should cause us to wrestle with the information that we're hearing. Okay, that's a good sermon. If you came in here every Sunday and just heard things that you already agreed with, I would say that there's not a lot of growth going on in our lives. Amen. So we actually need to be challenged, right? We, we don't, we don't, we're not, we don't have the monopoly on every single right belief. We actually don't have that. So a good sermon, can you, you'll remember this, a good sermon is not meant to be agreed with, but wrestled with. Okay, everybody all right with that one? Okay, so the scriptures actually encourage us to work out our salvation. The scriptures also encourage us to come and reason together. So today, even though this is not quite a sermon, you may not agree with everything I say, right? (laughs) 
Uh, I know that's unusual, Vaughn. Um, but we can wrestle through it together. And on that note, tomorrow night, we are launching our pop-up pop Rock School of Sonship. Okay, and I just want to invite you, if you haven't been, if you've never participated in a School of Sonship, please come. We want you there because it is an environment where we really dig deep and we unpack some stuff. And this this pop-up, our next six weeks, we're going to be unpacking sinners in the hands of a loving God, okay? And we're going to be touching on things like the atonement. We're going to be touching on things like hell, right? And all those sorts of things. And it's going to be great. And I can guarantee you, you're going to need to wrestle. I'm going to guarantee you that you won't agree initially with everything you hear. But I want to tell you that that's okay. Right? There's a time and a place for it. And School of Sonship is our safe environment. We're all on the same. We're all sitting at the same table. And all of our wrestling and stuff is okay. All right, so that's just a plug for School Sonship tomorrow night here at 6.45. Okay, so, but one of the things that, you know, my prayer is this morning in sharing these uh, thoughts with you is that Jesus will be glorified, that the cross and the resurrection will get bigger in your lives, that you'll be built up in your faith, and you'll leave here today feeling equipped and encouraged, and maybe a little bit determined to unpack some stuff. So um, this, I'm just going to head straight for the big sacred cow, straight up front, right? Why not, okay? One of the things, now look, I'm still working this out, all right? So this morning, I want to let you know that I'm not standing up here saying that I've arrived. I'm not standing up here to say to you, all of my beliefs are 100% you know, like my final beliefs, um, and I hope that's okay with you. But, you know, one of the things that I used to have some really funny ideas about was the anointing. Anyone? <laughs> can anyone relate? I used to have some funny ideas about the anointing, and it was that in order to preach well, to counsel, to pray... I had to say some special words to somehow get under the anointing. And who we have Jesus. He is the anointing. He is the anointed one. He is the anointing. And where is he? He's not somewhere off in outer space or in some other country. He's within us. You carry the anointed one within you. How does that begin to transform our thinking? Because it's no longer I that live, but he that lives in me. So I am anointed. I'm anointed. Um, and you know, he's poured out his spirit. Like, I don't know about you, but you know, like, I guess I've had some funny ideas of what that might look like. Like God's up there, the big bucket. He's pouring it out here because they sang the right songs. They said the right words, they prayed enough, or God somehow favours those that group of people rather than that group of people, and then this group of people are striving to try and have what that group of people have. Like, I, for me, like, I'm wrestling with some of those ideas, but I know that the Holy Spirit's been poured out and lives within us, amen? And the Holy Spirit's primary primary um, ministry is to teach us and to guide us into all truth. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You can look that up in 1 John 2, 18 and 19. So um, and another thing, like another thing that I wish that every follower of Jesus knew was that our faith, your faith, my faith, was never intended to be a destination or a status right? God is not some distant destination to be reached. Instead, our faith 
is like a road, like Pastor Henry was sharing. It's a path. It's a way out of old and destructive patterns of living and walking into new and creative ones. And one of the things that I've learned, you know, over the long haul, long time, is that this road, this journey, it has plenty of bumps, right? It's got some massive potholes. At times, we're walking on unsealed roads, winding paths, ups and downs. Sometimes the road ahead is hard to see. And we feel like we've taken a detour, like I felt like that. But following Jesus, because what? He is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And Jesus is present right here, right now. He's not off somewhere down the road that I just can't see and I've just got to get there. No, he's so present. He's present to us. His mercies are new every morning. He's not in the future next week. You know, when I've read my Bible well and I've prayed well and my, I'm fasting and all that sort of stuff, he's present right here, right now. What would he say to you this morning? He would say to you, weary traveller, maybe you are, Weary traveller, my burden is easy and my light, my yoke is light. Would you like a drink? Be refreshed. Would you like to be refreshed in my presence? This is what he invites us to every morning. Sometimes we don't take the time to engage in that grace. Like his mercy is new every morning, but we've got to engage in it. We've actually got to sit down like breakfast and engage in that new mercy, right? And um, so put your hand up, if you will. If there are things that you believe today, I ask this question a lot. I know who's going to put their hand up. Um, Put your hand up if there are things that are different than what you believed 10 years ago. Put your hand up. A few of you. Some of you still stuck 10 years ago, believing those same things. Put your hand up five years ago, one year ago. Amen. So now I want to invite you to put your hand up if you think it might be possible that in 12 months' time, some of the things that you've believed might have shifted even again, totally. But remember what I said about the declarations? There are absolutes, right? That Jesus is Lord, that the cross was successful. Amen. Like these are our absolutes. These are our declarations of faith that they won't change. But guess what? Some of the ways that we've seen, some of the ways that we've understood, some of the things that have had us caught down in religion and law and exclusion, like thinking who's in, who's out, like some of that stuff, Praise God that it's going to shift off our lives. Amen? Amen. This belief in a transactional God, that's going to shift off our lives, right? So there are things that I once believed so adamantly, right, that now I don't believe at all. I've let go. And in a way, I had to disagree with myself in order to grow in truth. I had to wrestle through cognitive dissonance. When I heard stuff, that, oh, touch something in me that I didn't agree with. I could either just like blow it off and say, well, you're wrong and I'm right. Or I could recognize what was actually going on on the inside of me. I could be open to the spirit of God. I can be open to letting go of that and opening my arm, my hands and my heart and my mind. You know, as Christians, it's okay to have a mind to think about things, to think things through, to wrestle with our faith, to unpack our idea of God, what we believe about the nature of God. It's good because I believe an integrated whole person is someone who does that work. Amen? Yes. Okay. 
right. Jesus repeated a phrase over and over when he was challenging this rigid thinking. And he was saying, he said in the scriptures, you have heard it said, but I say. You have heard it said, but I say. There's a lot of people, a lot of talk out there about this idea of deconstruction, whatever you want to call that, okay? And it gets a bad rap because of, you know, some people's understanding of what deconstruction might mean, okay? But you know what? Renovating your faith, knocking down a few walls, you know, stripping off some old paint is a good thing. Jesus, that's, he preached it. He preached it. He was de- getting them to deconstruct their ideas of the law. And he was challenging them. He was always saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And he was always like, eh, eh, with his word, right? Amen. And he was introducing ideas that people had wondered about. Like, don't think, some of those things that you wonder about, especially as a young adult, probably, and then as you get older in life, you start to question some of this stuff again. But, you know, these people, I'm sure, that Jesus was introducing these ideas and people had already been thinking some of these things, but they were afraid. They were afraid of being cast out of the temple. They were afraid of being cut off from the religious elite. Um, But Jesus' words, they're full of grace and truth. And as a result, like he attracted the religious, the irreverent and the immoral. Like people felt safe in approaching Jesus. People, think about that woman at the well. She felt safe. She felt safe. Sadly, you know, there's many expressions of the church and um, of Christians that they obsess and they, they, they plant their flag. Um, they anchor in over their interpretation of the scriptures that from their perspective make them more right than others. But Jesus said that he was the way, that he was the truth and that he was the life. Truth is found in the person of Jesus. Can I say that again? Truth is found in the person of Jesus, not just on the pages of the Bible. Okay? So today I would like to ask you what you might need to let go of in order to grow. See, a transformational faith is one whereby we are transformed by God's presence in our lives. Our faith is not about having all the answers. It's about choosing to trust. It's about choosing to trust, especially when I don't have all the answers. That's what faith is. And, you know, sometimes we're not sure about our faith. I mean, do I have enough faith to just keep going forward? But I want to say to you too, like, um, it's in, where is it? Uh, Galatians 2.20 in the King James Bible, mind you, says that the life that I now live, I live by, by the faith of the Son of God. What I want you to do in that, with that scripture is that I want you to really underline faith of the Son of God. You see, our faith, and we, we read in the scripture that without faith it's impossible to please God. And, but here we read something different in the scriptures. It says, the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's different. There's a different nuance there. It's not about my faith. It's about me living now by his faith. So would I rather my faith or would I rather live by the faith of the Son of God? I know which one I would choose. I'm choosing to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, who believes in me who said that it is good. Amen? So um, it's not about having all the answers. In Matthew 28, verse 17, it says they worshipped him. Okay. They worshipped him. This is after the, you know, the resurrection. Jesus revealed himself to the disciples. They worshipped him, but some doubted. They worshipped him. 
but some doubted. You know, Jesus built his church on the lives of doubting worshippers, and he still does. Amen. Jesus built his church on the lives of doubting worshippers, and he still does. So I wish every follower of Jesus knew that it was okay to have doubts at times, that it's, it's healthy. It's healthy. And as I look back um, over my life, coming into faith at 20, I would say that I pursued a relationship with a distant God. And I pursued that relationship with a distant God through the scripture, you know, recommended King James Version. Um, And, you know, like that was challenging. And we were told, we were told that sin, sin had separated um, us from God. And that through a series of spiritual disciplines and saying a prayer and daily Bible reading, that we could have a relationship with that God through my act of doing these things, of reading, saying a prayer, reading, praying, that I could have a relationship with God because of that. But I want to say to you, the reason why I can have a relationship with God is because of what Christ did. Amen? It's what Christ did. It's not through what I do. It's what Christ did. And when I recognize that, like, okay, for some of us, that's maybe a slight nuance and, you know, it's like, what? It, but it makes a difference because so many of us are caught up in transactional ways of thinking about God. If I do enough, you know, I have a relationship. If I don't do enough, he somehow removed himself from us. And so this just puts us on this cycle and this wheel of, you know, like trying to please God. He's pleased with you. He's pleased with you. He accepts you. He welcomes you. And, um, you know, when I discovered that this way of thinking believes that I'm not right with God, I'm separated because I haven't prayed enough, worshipped enough, read the Bible enough, given enough. So therefore, I've got to do in order to get right with God. And I just, for me, that resulted in lots of years of never quite feeling like I was cutting it. I don't know about you, but that's how I experienced it, even as a pastor, as a leader. I felt like I was continually falling short. And, you know, Colossians 1, you know, when we talk about this idea of sin separating us from God, well, Colossians 1 says that we were once separated from God, but it was that we were alienated in our own minds, in our own thinkings, that we were the ones that were separated from him. Because you just think about it, think about it. Like, how can sin separate us from God? How can it? It can it. It can't. Because God is everywhere. This, the scriptures, this very same scriptures tell us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nor height, nor depth, not angel, demon, not even the depths of hell, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So when we build our beliefs on a foundation of separation... We start at Genesis 3 and we see the fall of Adam. Um, instead, of, instead of Genesis 1, that we were created in the image of God, it actually, you know, it, it actually causes us to enter into the cycle of striving and performance-based thinking and behaving. And I just want to tell you, what are the, you know, one of the things that I'm learning over, over these years is that that's really not helpful. It's not a helpful way of following Jesus so you know I used to see myself as a sinner I used to see myself as that's that was who, my identity that I was a sinner and that I somehow needed Jesus blood to cover me because God couldn't look at me because I was a sinner and that was my identity but I know I don't think about it like that anymore it's not that I can't sin or don't sin you know, but I'm starting, my starting pl- place in life and relationship with God is that I am a beloved daughter. I am prone to do good. 
I am prone to righteousness and I'm alive in Christ. So just in closing, some things that I wish that every follower of Jesus knew. Let's not approach living. Let's not approach prayer, reading the scriptures, worship, serving, even our faith and our doubt. Yes, our doubts. Let's not approach that from a place of lack or separation. Start with inclusion. Start with inclusion. You are included. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Live by his faith. Amen. Sin is a sickness and it's a condition that needs healing. And Jesus is our loving healer. Okay? Um, It's in him that we live and move and have our being. There's so much more for us to recover. Our ordinary, everyday lives, our eating, our drinking, our sleeping are holy and sacred unto the Lord. I used to think that those sorts of things were very secular and they had nothing to do with God, but I'm recovering my life, my ordinary daily life where my eating, my drinking, even my sleeping is holy. Amen? It's good. God made us human. Turn to your neighbor and say, I was created human. God loved humanity so much that he came and he joined with humanity. Amen? So let's walk in the light as he is in the light. This means you begin to see your life and everything that concerns you from your father's point of view. So I think there's much more that I could say. But I just wish every follower of Jesus would know that God is good. He's so much better than we thought. And, you know, for me, it's been a joy, especially over these last few years, just unpacking and wrestling and being okay to explore a little and I want to invite you as well like in your lives like your faith doesn't have to just stay how it is like if you've got things that you're not certain of you know things that how you've read the scriptures and what you've taken from them I want to encourage you that it's okay to press in and maybe look at that from different perspectives you know in the Jew, the Jewish Jewish practice the the rabbis that they say that the Torah which is the first five books of the Old Testament they say the Torah had 70 faces and so that when they view the scriptures they're looking for many facets right there's just not one way of reading and that's in part two of my my message about literally reading the Bible literally and the challenges that is for us at times. So that's it from me this morning. Like I hope some of the things I've said have maybe resonated, maybe some things you didn't agree with, and that is good. And I hope that you would take those things and unpack them, all right, when you go home. But most of all, I want to tell you today that Jesus loves you, and he knows you. He knows your journey. He knows your story. And, you know, sometimes... We're just at a place in our lives when we just aren't participating in that. We're not participating in that life. I want to invite you today. Is it simple as saying, Jesus, you know, I want to participate in your life. I, I, want to, I, I know that you're with me and I want to know that. I want to be aware of that. And I just say the road ahead will be not without bumps and, you know, twists and turns, but He's holding your hand and he he wants to participate in life with you. You're not alone. So be blessed. I just want to pray. So thank you, Lord, this morning. I thank you, Lord. You know, there's lots of people that could stand up here and talk about, you know, the things that you've done in their lives and the things that you're doing in their lives. And I thank you. I thank you that our faith is actually active and is growing and it's, you know, getting deeper and wider and it's including more people. I thank you, Lord, that um, just to, to know you and to know your goodness and to know that 
you know, we're never separated from you and to know what it is to be included throughout our journey. I just want to say thank you, Lord. I pray that if there's people here that, you know, their road might be bumpy at the moment or, you know, they may feel like they've sitting, you know, they're taking a seat on the sideline. I pray this morning that you would speak into their hearts this morning as well and that you would remind them of your love for them, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.